Hi, and welcome back to Nordic Testing Day 2021. Uh, our next speaker comes from Serbia, or, well, comes, calls in from Serbia, rather, and, uh, and is going to be talking about hardware. So that's an interesting subject. Uras, hello. Hello. How, how's the weather? Uh, very nice here, around 25, 26 degrees, sunny outside and warm. So, yeah, very nice. Well, I mean, it's it's warm here as well, but it's it's like 21, so that's warm. Oh. <laughs> that's nice right, as well. But, uh, the floor is yours. Go. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, yeah. Today, my name is Ulrich Stanisic, <clears throat> as you already heard, probably. Um, I am engineering lead uh, at HTEC Group, uh, and I have um, 15 years of experience in uh, software testing. Uh, today is my first time on Nordic Testing Days, and um, yeah, this is an online format, and I hope that some next time, maybe next year, I'll be able to meet at least some of you and uh, some of the lovely organizers, uh, let's say, on site for a change. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, fundamental cookbook for testing with hardware. And the uh, majority of my experience uh, comes from projects like these. And I'm really passionate about uh, testing with hardware and uh, all the interesting things it brings. And yeah, I want to share it with you today. So. When we say uh, testing with hardware, what does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, in projects like these, you have a, let's say, some device, piece of equipment. Uh, so yeah, hardware, license, uh, firmware that is running on it. We have a software application, which maybe controls that hardware or communicates with it. And we have a communication protocol <clears throat> uh, between these two. So uh, what I've been doing in my teams in uh, these past 15 years, so we were developing either sometimes software uh, in these systems, sometimes software and communication protocol, and sometimes all three components, so software communication protocols and um, hardware themselves. So these projects are, let's say, very specific and bring uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, so today I wanna share some of them with you, the most important ones. Some of the epiphanies I had in this uh, in this road, and some tips and tricks uh, that you might use if you come up with projects uh, like this. And I want to do it as a let's say project story. So for one project uh, from the beginning until the end, I mean successful end <laughs> and, and its deployment uh, at the end customer. So now imagine that you are uh, joining, uh, let's say, first uh, project with hardware, or yeah, maybe uh, second. And the uh, first thing that you notice in projects like this is that uh, usually there's a big domain knowledge gap uh, between your current knowledge and uh, needs and demands of a project. Uh, so, yeah, you maybe have some uh, prior experience in software development, software testing, and so on. But uh, these projects are rather, let's say, specific with what they bring. And uh, what you notice is that you need to start quickly closing the domain knowledge gap. One obvious source for that are your colleagues. Uh, yeah, maybe you are joining the project that is running for a while. So you have uh, your colleagues uh, with more experience, uh, so they might help you as well. Uh, also, another obvious, uh, probably obvious uh, source uh, is your customer. Um, usually customers know more about their business domain than you, so they uh, might help you a lot when onboarding on projects like this. And uh, more often than not, uh, projects like these are um, regulated by some international standardization bodies or uh, certification bodies and they usually have a lot of documentation that might help you 
this documentation is not necessarily easy to read and understand in the beginning, but at least it will give you a head start and uh, yeah, probably generate a lot of questions that might help you uncover all the things that you will need to succeed in projects like this. Uh, next thing that you learn rather quickly or at the beginning of the projects is that hardware is pretty um, elusive. Um, usually we were in a position to start uh, development uh, of let's say software piece uh, of the system uh, before hardware is ready. And if you ask the question when it will be ready, uh, the usual answers we get in a few months, three to six months, something like that. And um, my favorite was uh, within a year. So what you and your team can do about that, uh, anyway, you will not sit idly <laughs> and wait for the hardware, but uh, instead of that, you can uh, build an emulator that will emulate the real thing. Um, some people might say emulator, some people might use another word, simulator. Uh, in this context, we use the emulator. Uh, if you're interested more in differences between emulators and simulators, I encourage you to uh, do a short research online. There, are, there is a lot of material about that. Um, what's important to remember when building emulators for any piece of, uh, let's say, equipment or hardware, uh, is usually that those things are complex because they tend to um, emulate uh, and mimic the behavior of the uh, real hardware, real devices. Uh, also, you need to remember that it is also yeah, another piece of software that you will need to maintain. So hardware and firmware might change over time, so you would need to maintain the emulators as well. And uh, when thinking about building one, uh, think about uh, making them universal. Uh, so, for example, if you have multiple, let's say, instruments or devices doing something, uh, think about building one emulator, if that's possible, because uh, it will make your life easier uh, to emulate, to have everything in one place and to maintain it in uh, just a single place. But remember, since we already said that emulators is uh, another piece of software, so, yeah, treat it as a software project, because it is. Uh, and it comes with its own set of expectations and requirements. And uh, these, let's say, expectations and requirements are not necessarily something that's driven by your uh, customer. Uh, it may be something uh, that is uh, driven by your team. But uh, uh, anyway, you should treat it as a, just an equal part of a system and uh, as another software application. So, um, next thing, now when you get an emulator, you're slowly closing the domain knowledge gap, you're getting the emulator, and uh, let's say the initial parts of the application are getting uh, um, ready and available for you to test. A uh, very important thing from the beginning uh, in projects like this is to uh, advocate for testability for very beginning. Uh, testability is very important here, uh, because how we usually uh, do in projects like these, uh, we usually develop uh, things like uh, some, let's say, analytics engines, calculation engines, um, uh, or data flows, data transformations first. And uh, sometimes uh, products like these even don't have a UI part. So if they do have a UI part, it's usually being developed later on. So in order to test something, um, you would do it in a different way and not uh, through or via UI, usually, at least in the beginning. Uh, for that, it's very important uh, to say that, um, yeah, you advocate for testability from very beginning. And uh, I am pretty sure that uh, at least some of you have heard about the um, famous CODS model by Rob Mini, um, which speaks about testability. So from that one, we are um, especially uh, turning uh, our point to controllability and observability because it's very important for you at this stage to be able to control the system 
into the right state, um, let's say in a fairly easy manner, uh, and to observe what's going on uh, in that state and when system uh, gets out of that state. So how are you going to do that in a, let's say, effective way? So by providing the right inputs at the right time and by creating the efficient logging uh, strategy. When talking about uh, the inputs, uh, in the very beginning, it's very important to define the right scope uh, for them and to obtain the right si uh, sa sample size. Uh, the scope and sample size uh, will grow over time, most probably, uh, but it's very uh, important to identify the most, uh, um, to, to write scope and sample size in the beginning because it will verify the very foundations uh, of the product you are building. When it comes to logging strategy, uh, it's uh, important to, let's say, uh, make it work for you. Uh, since you are testing a lot of things that are going on, uh, let's say, without UI, uh, some, like I said, calculations, transformations, data flows, and whatnot, and you should be able to find whatever you need uh, rather quickly and in an in efficient way. So when thinking about logging strategy, uh, think about that. What would you like to have there? Uh, how you would like to go through it? And um, yeah, not to overload with some, overload it with some unnecessary information, but uh, yeah, to think about what's really important and uh, make it really uh, easy to find. And usually in projects like this, uh, this is the first time uh, when you're feeling really, really good and confident uh, because, uh, yeah, you are closing your domain knowledge gap still, but you are rel relatively good uh, compared to your start <laughs> at this point. Uh, you have the emulator, which is helping you test uh, uh, various features uh, of your system. Uh, you are seeing things going on. You're able to control, system, to control the system, uh, to test it through, through uh, this logging strategy and see what's going on. And you start feeling pretty well at this stage. And then, of course, something else happens. <laughs> and uh, usually, uh, after a while, you um, realize the complexity of these systems. And I already mentioned some calculations and transformations. And... Um, data and data flows and their complexity is um, usually very obvious from the beginning but uh, not to everyone so to say in in projects like this and uh, its um, requirements change and uh, um, calculations and transformations probably grow over time in their complexity believe me and also these devices and instruments can run in different configurations and at the end you need to test them all so what to do in this case you automate and uh, at least try to automate and try to automate whatever steals your time um, so projects like these uh, regarding the automation are different than let's say some other usual let's say project uh, projects in a way that uh, things that are going um, on a ui that are happening on a ui level are pretty simple, let's say like that. So for example, sometime, uh, sometimes testing effort uh, to let's say create a result, for example, you are measuring your, I don't know, cholesterol in your blood. And uh, to create a result with some input data that we are providing is, instead of a real blood, let's say in this, um, in this period of time, uh, it takes you maybe around, 20 30 seconds to do but to prepare that data and to analyze what happened um, let's say with the data and uh, realize that your cholesterol level is for example four which is really good thing for you uh, it takes a lot of time so what do you do then you automate whatever steals your time so you want create a ui test which will, let's say, speed up something that takes 20, 30 seconds of time, uh, you create unit or integration tests for those calculations and transformations, for example. Uh, on some projects, uh, we have 
we have had enormously, um, let's say, data preparation procedure. Uh, and th those data were used for, yeah, like testing the system, the input data. So what we did, uh, we automated that. So preparation of the data itself. And of course, the different configurations. So for example, you might want to automate, um, for example, a feature sp like spinning out the, uh, the right configuration to test different configurations in an easy way and running a different set of tests uh, on those configurations. Then uh, usually at this point uh, in the projects, uh, you get the real thing, the real hardware and you get to play with it finally. Uh, what that means, so should you then stop using emulator now when you got uh, the real thing? Usually, no, uh, you will not stop using it and you will continue using it probably uh, in a measure that you didn't expect it. <laughs> um, so, um, let's say that on some projects, uh, when we got uh, the ready hardware or first, let's say, prototype, we still continued using uh, emulators for like 19 or 95 percent of the time uh, because they are more convenient, uh, they are faster, they uh, do not, let's say, <laughs> use your desk space and things like uh, that. But uh, for certain things, of course, you need to play. Uh, with the real thing and real hardware. You need to remember at this point that uh, emulators cannot do everything. They are good up to the point, uh, but they cannot be, uh, let's say, used for time-related testing. Uh, they can to a measure, uh, they can mimic some time-related uh, operations, uh, but not in a, let's say, um, reliable uh, measure. And of course, you shouldn't use them uh, for performance and ability testing because emulator is just another, let's say, maybe PC application that is running on your PC and it's not a real device. So most probably your application, let's say, or communication between the application and the device will not behave the same if you're using the emulator and the uh, real device. Um, what? I would like to share with you is uh, also another uh, success story from one project uh, where uh, my team was able to use, uh, so to say, hardware as an ultimate uh, emulator and how they uh, achieved it. Well, this was a brand new uh, project, brand new product uh, built from scratch. So the uh, hardware, firmware, communication and software were built uh, from scratch, something completely new. And the firmware uh, for that device was created in a very clever way, in a sense that it can be built uh, as a firmware, which you then deploy on the device, or just with a, let's say, flip of a switch, uh, you uh, create a desktop application, which is then an emulator, uh, which you can use for further testing. So by doing this, uh, the team saved a lot of time and energy because you get, let's say, firmware, which is also an emulator. So it's the same code base. Whenever firmware is changed, well, updated, uh, the, it, it's the emulator, right? So it, the emulator is updated. And uh, so you have one code base, no need to maintain a separate um, code for um, emulator. And uh, again, you save yourself uh, from situations which happen from time to time, uh, that when you are testing something on an emulator and a device, your system behaves in a different way. Then you need to investigate what's going on and whether where's the problem, whether it's on a device or an emulator or communication, whatnot. So if you're in a possibility to advocate for something like that, in uh, similar projects, I am really encouraging you to do so. So now you are using uh, your piece of equipment more and more. Uh, you're getting familiar with it and um, yeah, you're getting confident with it. 
Uh, but you need to remember that sometimes uh, this equipment and uh, these devices uh, are running in some special or certain uh, conditions. So I hope that you can see uh, what's written on the, this white cup. Uh, it says go outside. So yeah, it's something that you need to remember. So go outside and test uh, uh, the devices in their real conditions. Um, and I will share you a short story with you how I learned it, and I learned it in a hard way. Um, I was visiting a customer uh, to, to test some devices in their dedicated lab. Uh, it was uh, summertime, it was warm and, and uh, very warm and very sunny outside, and I was appropriately dressed for that weather. When I came around to a uh, customer for a first day, um, they put me in a lab and then I learned throughout the day that uh, special conditions in a lab were held in a sense that uh, for all time it was 16 degrees Celsius in it and the temperature could not change. So you can imagine how frozen I was by the end of the day one. Uh, so tomorrow the next day I yeah, brought another piece of <laughs> clothes with me. Um, also, we had, uh, let's say, my colleagues on some transportation projects, for example, uh, they were driving in buses and trams, testing their systems. Uh, one time we were developing, uh, let's say, some system that used uh, some very specific valve, so to say, and the system controlled that valve, and it was valve for yeah, liquid water, so we needed to obtain a big pool and put a valve in it and test it over there, and so on and so on. So you need to remember in what uh, specific conditions your um, equipment is uh, functioning, and you need to make sure that you are able to either provide the right environment um, or either to mimic it uh, closely and test it in that environment. Um, also, at some uh, projects, uh, you need to pass a certain uh, certification by third party uh, certification bodies. And uh, if you need to do it often, it's a good thing to uh, think about uh, automating the certification process. Um, so, for example, on some projects, uh, you need to pass the certification with uh, every release, so to say. And the certification is, a, let's say, process where um, the certification body uh, issues like a set of conditions that your system needs to satisfy. And you can kind of look at it as a set of test cases that you need to pass in order to pass the certification. And what's a good thing about it, uh, that the certification uh, bodies usually accept uh, log files as a proof that you uh, executed uh, the pre prescribed set of conditions or test cases. So then we come back a little bit to logging strategy uh, we talked about earlier on. So when building logging strategy and uh, if you need to pass certain certification, you can also think about it, how you can um, make it available and easy way to, to, to be, let's say, uh, displayed in your log files. So at this point, you are, uh, let's say, finishing your project, you are past the certification, everything is well. So you need just to deploy uh, your system to the end customer. And uh, what is a good advice here, and uh, yeah, like for probably any other uh, project and product, is to do a staged rollout. Uh, to yeah, first uh, install it at few customers, customers starting from uh, better customers and uh, spread from there. Um, and also what's a good advice here is to think about wherever it's possible about auto update, adding that functionality to, uh, to your system. Because um, nowadays we are kind of used to that, uh, for example, on our mobile phones, our applications are being auto updated like on a daily level and we do not notice that. But uh, usually in systems like this, um, the auto update uh, feature, let's call it like that, is still, still, let's say, rare. It's not possible everywhere, so to say, but wherever it's possible, 
if you uh, can do it, please do it because you will probably save a lot of time and energy uh, for, like, for example, of some technicians and uh, people maybe at your customer site. And at the end, that's it. So we reached the end of uh, our project or multiple projects. And what we usually realize that there's no magic recipe for, uh, for each project uh, and testing with hardware. Uh, but every project is different in a similar fashion and um, unique in a similar fashion. Uh, but uh, over the years, what I realized that there are some um, things that always are helping me and helping my team and my teammates. And uh, yeah, I call them fundamental cookbook for testing with hardware. And those are these seven things. So close the domain knowledge gap as soon as you can. Um, when hardware is missing, yeah, emulate it, create an emulator. Advocate for testability, it will help you a lot over time. Automate whatever steals your time. Don't chase just UI tests, for example, or UI testing for the sake of it. Uh, test your system in real conditions, automate certification wherever it's possible, and make your deployment smart. Thank you. Any questions? So, uh, yeah, I will, I'm just now looking if we are getting any questions in from WorkSup. But um, before that, I, I have a couple of my own. So just to comment, uh, first of all, uh, really loved your slides. Uh, in any other uh, Thank you. situation, I would have stolen some of them for PowerPoint karaoke later in the evening. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no such luck this year, unfortunately. Maybe next year. Yeah, we can organize it as a, as a separate uh, online event, maybe <laughs> before next year. Maybe, but, but next year, hopefully, we can have it on location. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the 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 comment about what you mentioned about hardware and and real conditions. Um, even real conditions can sometimes uh, ha be sort of uh, interesting because my. Uh, my old iPad, for example, I, I had it in my car in winter in Estonia, so it's minus like 25 degrees outside. I, I take the iPad from the car, I try to start using it, and it says, your device needs to cool down before use. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can guess what happened there. So it was outside the, the range of temperature that was specified, but uh, in California, it can only go outside of it in one direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they probably hadn't uh, even thought of that. Uh, so probably. Uh, speaking, speaking of questions, uh, you, you mentioned complexity in the context of emulators, but uh, which would you mm -hmm. say in, in your experience is more complex on the whole, hardware or software? Whoa, <laughs> that's a that's a really good question. Um, they're specific in their own way, so to say. And uh, for example, I'm coming more from a software background, so I might incline to say, yeah, probably software. But then some someone coming from more like a hardware background will say uh, something different. So it really, the, I would say that there's no right or wrong answer. It really depends on a system. And it's uh, something that is really in common of these projects is that uh, this requires a lot of coordination and a lot of teamwork in order to succeed. So yeah, the system as a whole should be uh, regarded as a complex and not just the, its parts like hardware or software. Yeah, exactly. And also if, uh, if uh, even if hardware is sufficiently simple and the software running on it uh, is also simple in, in itself then when you combine it it's complex and no matter what so. exactly exactly yeah. well I, I have some funny stories for example uh, some people regarding hardware as a more important part and uh, whatnot and then for example software people uh, come and say okay your piece of equipment is just a brick without the software <laughs> which is actually true but then, yeah, as I said, you can, you should be looking at it as a system, uh, as a whole. 
And, and on the other hand, the software is just an idea without the hardware. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, uh, getting some questions now from WorksUp as well. Uh, what is the starting point for testing hardware itself without software? For hardware itself? Uh, well, as soon as possible. I would say it's the uh, similar uh, as with the software. So wherever you have some requirements, let's call it like that, uh, or ideas or desires, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's the good way to start. Because uh, also from a software perspective, we are talking about uh, thing as soon as possible. So with verification of the ideas themselves. So I would say it's similar with hardware as well. Mm -hmm. uh, then what's the difference between hardware and firmware testing? Are these firmware testing even possible without hardware? Oh, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, so what's the difference? Well, uh, let's say hardware is your equipment. Uh, you can test it in a uh, some ways we even without uh, let's say firmware so you can test certain parts uh, of it or how they behave on, under s certain circumstances like uh, I don't know um, load uh, uh, that you put on it or, or um, certain temperatures and things like that uh, with firmware and whether you can test firmware without hardware I would say no I would say it's better to do it uh, together and to test firmware, um, let's say in isolation. Yeah, I would say, yeah, probably do it together. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's another question. How would you test a pen? <laughs> ah, that's a testing question. <laughs> how, how would you test a pen? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> So usually it's, uh, uh, this is do, being done uh, with a couple of beers and, and, and around some <laughs> dinner and <laughs> playing some testing games. So to test a pen, well, depends uh, what kind of pen is it. So uh, on what kind of surface it should uh, write, uh, what color or how long it should write, uh, I don't know. How many times, uh, how do you uh, activate it? Do you click it, do you turn it or what not? Uh, how many times you should do it? <sighs> Anything else? Yeah, I don't know. That's first. Left or right-handed? <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, ergonomy, <laughs> very important thing. Maybe if I had a, a beer or two, I would have more <laughs> ideas. <laughs> oh, that's great. But yeah, uh, this is a good question. Uh, and, and these fun questions continue. Which is more fun, testing pure software or with some hardware? Uh, for me, as I said, uh, I am biased. Uh, I uh, am uh, doing projects like this for 15 years, almost. And I had maybe a couple of projects uh, that were just pure software. And for me, this is more, more fun. But like I said, I'm biased. I'm really passionate about systems like this, where you have hardware, you have communication uh, between software and hardware. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of nuances in these projects. I mean, in every kind of project, but as I said, I'm really biased and passionate about this and I really like it more compared to the, let's say, projects where you test just pure software, so to say. And, and I, would, I would also argue that uh, I, don't remember any uh, situations where I have personally tested only software without using any hardware to do that. But that, oh, you know, so a colleague. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but who, yeah, nobody wants to be that guy at a party, right? Uh, then <laughs> another question: uh, Did you test those devices from the sixteen degrees room also outside? And were there any bugs related to those conditions? Uh, no, we didn't test it outside because they are kept at constant temperature at the laboratory. And uh, the thing is, those are um, uh, it, the temperature itself is not about the devices, but uh, for uh, let's say chemicals being used there. Uh, I mentioned some uh, blood tests, for example. So it's for. Um, biochemical analyzer. So uh, it analyzes, uh, let's say, body fluids. 
And uh, so for the reagents and samples uh, being used, uh, that uh, temperature needs to be in the lab. So the lab needs to be kept uh, those uh, conditions. And uh, yeah, we didn't test it on a, let's say, higher temperature than it's prescribed by uh, lab practices in that domain. I, I, I mean that, I, and if it's meant to be operated in on, on those conditions, then, you know, anything else would be a discrepancy anyway. So doesn't really matter what uh, the hardware actually does outside of the uh, yeah, range. Yeah. Anyway, uh, if you, yeah, if you uh, don't keep uh, these things at uh, prescribed temperatures, you will get uh, bad results. So, mm, yeah. yeah, true. So, uh, not reliable. Uh, so, uh, yeah. speaking of speaking of testing hardware, I, I have a remote control here that controls the uh, hardware behind me so I can uh, make the glass transparent. Oh, nice. Oh, and, and, nice. And there's, there's, there, there's someone there waving to us. So I'm not alone here. <laughs> <laughs> Great feature. <laughs> uh, so it's, piece of uh, there's yeah, awesome. Mart in the other room uh, keeping an eye on things. So, and I can hide him again. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So it's, it's, it's fun doing it uh, virtually as well, especially if you have a chance to have people <clears throat> behind the glass. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have some sort of uh, glossy background there, I see. But probably yeah, not, yeah, it's, uh, a, it's, a, it's a for drawing table. Uh, so ah okay yeah yeah so it's reflecting the the lights from the roof yeah like, yeah, like, yeah a little like bit yeah. I, I don't have a fancy clicker and uh, yeah fancy glass <laughs> like you yeah well I mean it's not mine so uh, tomorrow <laughs> I will miss it <laughs> right. okay but actually I don't see any more questions from workshop at the moment. Uh, let me see if I have something. Ah, I, I had a question about automation. So uh, for you or, or in your experience, how hard is it to concentrate uh, on automating what really steals your time instead of what is easiest to automate? Uh, usually, as I said, projects like these start in a very specific way. And uh, from very beginning, uh, you are learning what takes you, uh, what steals your time, so to say. And, mm. uh, and you just, for some things, you hope that uh, maybe you will be able to be faster and faster uh, for that. But uh, for some things, uh, you see that uh, doing it takes uh, longer and longer uh, time as, as the project progresses. And then you make a decision, okay, let's see if we can automate something like this. And you just follow the next, uh, let's say, biggest thing that steals away your time and, and do it in a such way. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, but thanks. And uh, since we are, well, kind of, kind of uh, also coming to the end of this time slot, then... Um, this is where we would usually have an applause. Uh, I won't, uh, you know, do a solo applause here because that just sounds awkward. Uh, but, yeah. um, and, and also this is where, when I would give you uh, our present, but you will receive your Nordic Testing Days theme face mask uh, via post at some point in the future. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So thanks for thanks for your presentation and uh, it was really uh, interesting and insightful. So good to have a thanks bit of hardware also on the side. Okay. Oh, thanks for oh, sharing. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We have another question okay. from uh, Workshop. So <laughs> okay, I was already hearing uh, from the uh, other room that uh, they were going to switch us off. But how many findings have you found from production that didn't appear from uh, development or QA environments and why? Or is product uh, production data more specific somehow? Well, yeah, it happens. Uh, sometimes we get, uh, let's say, huh, depending on <laughs> what we are building. So, for example, if we are building 
uh, a new version of something that already exists, you kind of get probably good test data uh, as your input data from, let's say, previous versions, because probably same, let's say, format of data, whatever it is, is being used still. Uh, but uh, for new projects and something that is really built from scratch, well, yeah, depends. There are always bugs from a production, and it will always be. But I would say it's also similar with uh, uh, with other projects uh, that are, let's say, pure software, for example. So, for example, if you have, for some projects, huge databases, uh, you cannot imagine all the types of data that uh, production will have compared to your test environment. So I would say it's similar in that fashion. And okay, of course, there are then... always problems from production. <laughs> now, now, now I'm hearing that we're really out of time. So thanks again. Okay. Really Thank you for you having later. me. Yeah, hope to see you next year, maybe. Bye-bye.